Um, nuts? Nuts. 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 Not on! This is probably the nuttiest game we'll ever cover on this channel. A nut hunt. A game all about collecting and grabbing and then eating as many nuts as possible. Oh. Okay, well, uh, not really. This game is all about completing paths throughout this forest with squirrels. But hey, you're constantly picking up the acorns, the walnuts, the pecans, and the chestnuts. This is a 30 minute game for one to five people using your squirrels to mark your territory to link your paths for points. And that all sounds pretty nutty to me. So let's go. Here's a quick how to play. You want to have as many points at the game end by fulfilling these starting objectives. That will say two different areas on the board. It's your goal to have these locations connected by the game end by placing your pieces on the board. To actually place these pieces though, you need to spend these nuts from your hand. So you spend these nuts, then spawn a squirrel in the location, and then you pay that location's nut cost. Every turn, all you do is two things. Roll the die to move this fox around the board, then do one more thing. To start, this fox will move one space in the direction you rolled, and then you get to choose any combination of two nuts from where it lands. But then, here's the big mechanic, that if that fox lands on a space with squirrels, those squirrels have to do something called scattering, moving one hex away of their player's choosing, and yep, this can even be where the fox just came from. Then the current player has one of three extra actions to take. The main one is spawning squirrels by paying the not cost here on any tile of the board, just not where the fox is. Or they can hassle the fox to move it one more space to where they have pieces, gaining one nut in the process and resolving scattering. Or the last action is to get one more objective into your hand. One crucial thing though, not all these nuts, it's actually these nests. Nests are like little bases for your color, where once you have one down, it can never move from that space. So you don't have to worry about scattering away from that space now. Plus, to make a nest, it's any time you have three squirrels in one space, which then immediately transforms into that nest, and the placing of a nest causes other players to scatter away from that space. Oh, and then you also need at least one nest within your objective path to consider fulfilled, and each nest is worth two points on its own. The end of the game is triggered any time someone puts down their fourth nest. Then you score points off of objectives completed. Remember, you have to have a nest within it but you also get one more point for each hex in between the objective destinations. So if we had to go from Frolic Field to Muckville Marsh, it would be worth two more points here, since there's two hexes in between. Any objective that you don't fulfill is negative points, a half value rounded up. That's the game in a nutshell. That won't be the end of the nut jokes. Every turn, you have the die, roll it. Fox moves once, that can cause scattering, and then you can pick up two nuts from where it lands. Then you have an extra action here, usually, which is spawning a squirrel on the board. Then you just keep passing turns until someone places down their fourth nest to end the game. Then everyone reveals their objectives, see how many they scored, and whoever has the highest points wins the game. So that's the learning. Now it's time for the review. Gross time of this nutty hunt. Let's start with these components. Now, this is a prototype we've been sent. Really appreciate the plastic bag still, but we can't deny that this game just looks pretty good, especially with regards to all the printed art. It's the same graphic artist as Scythe and Wingspan, with lots of texture and different types of areas to start pulling you into this fantasy forest land. There's this froggy pond, or this memorable shroom area to get any magical nuts you want. And then there's unique player squirrel shapes, and the multiple types of nuts you can get are super distinct. All the cards are of great quality, like seriously, they all feel great in the hand. Even this player aid card is really clear, which really gets to how nut hunts is just easy to set up and learn. Setup is literally just making any giant hex shape you want with all these 19 tiles. So arrange in whatever is easiest. Learning with the rule book, uh, excuse a and half by 11, this is clear with there being a fantastic FAQ at the end. It's quite easy for newcomers to hop in because turns are all very streamlined by just rolling one die and then doing one more action on top of that. And you'll immediately know what to pursue with these starting objectives. Now let's go deeper into the gameplay pros. The first is the umbrella of the fascinating movement system in this game. Your main units, your squirrels, are exclusively tied to movement through other things, like the fox moving onto it or a nest being created. It's this immediate nuance in how you approach the map because you want to think about squirrel movement to gain advantage, but in doing so, you have to look at the entire map for the ingredients to actually move them. 
The primary way to move squirrels is running away from the fox. And this is through die rolling, which is random at a glance. But there's a good amount of ways to set up the map to have fox movement play towards your movement goals. For example, first you can spawn in any non-fox location. So spawning on the board is a huge decision where you factor in the cost in nuts to spawn as well as its current distance to the fox to see if you'll be forced to move sometime soon. Sometimes you'll want to spawn right next to the fox to hope he moves you. Oh, maybe spawning on the corners can make it more likely to get moved if the fox is close because if the fox were to move into nothing, it bounces the other way. Now there's two ways the fox can move here via bounce or just normally. Now let's get a little more into scattering, which is so neat because you get to choose wherever you scatter. You can even have two squirrels scatter in different locations for lots of options. It can get quite interactive with multiple people, squirrels just scurrying away on a hex as scattering gets resolved in player order. So then you can react to your opponent's scattering. The whole movement idea gets reinforced by choosing where you want to hunker down and not move by choosing to eventually place down your third squirrel for a nest on a space. Not only are you here permanently for the rest of the game, you can't ever get moved off of that, but by building a nest, you force everyone else to scatter off of that space. So yeah, just get off of my marsh, my swamp. The closest thing to an actual move is a thing called hassling the fox, where you can choose where to move the fox one more time. But there's a wrinkle to this where you can only move the fox to where you have a piece on the board. So you can always move to squirrels within range if you want to scatter your own, while also letting you scatter your opponent's squirrels who are also in that space. If you have a nest on a space, you can think of it like a permanent base where you can always pull that fox to and kick out others from that space. Or you can always choose it as a way to pull the fox out of a space you want empty for a later turn. And pretty much everyone's actions are interconnected with squirrels popping up left and right. You'll very frequently be forced to move your squirrels on someone else's turn, sometimes twice if they hassle the fox on top of moving him normally. Or you scatter twice if they move the fox normally, then play a squirrel to build a nest, and then you have to scatter. Oh, and then look, you can decide to build your own nest here. It just invites constant engagement. The next pro is the incredibly dynamic scoring that goes into all of this. See. Objectives at the end of the game are either positive points, you got it, or negative points, you don't got it. But since this board state is quite volatile with all these squirrels constantly scattering around, it's quite possible that the squirrels currently connecting your paths won't always stay that way. Or vice versa, if you didn't have that connection, well, you can always easily scatter into that. And look at that, now we have four points instead of negative two points. This gets even more nutty with the decision to draw more objectives where it's very optimal to draw at least one more objective, but then to keep drawing is subjecting yourself to risk of more negative points. Since the objectives are all hidden and players' motivations are somewhat clouded by the constant scattering, it's quite difficult to tell exactly what objectives your opponents have. This can add a nice bluffing element to try to posture on how many points you have, since the decision to end the game by placing down your fourth nest is always voluntary. While that fourth nest gives that person two more points, and then the comfort of having the last turn to solidify the board while scattering their opponents, this game ender is sometimes not quite sure if that will be enough to win the game. Maybe they should have waited another turn to achieve one more objective, or try to disrupt their opponent's pass somewhere else before ending the game. You just gotta keep looking at your opponents. Nut Hunt really emphasizes that you're not exactly trying to get the most victory points possible, Rather, you can blitz and end the game early to get a fairly low score, but still higher with your opponents with all their negative objectives now. Speaking of game end, this is the last gameplay bro where the game just has a cool ramp up overall. As the game goes on, there's just going to be more squirrels on the board, more objectives in people's hands. And so that means that every single fox movement can send more and more rifts throughout the board. One juicy and quite common occurrence in mid to late game is when the fox is moved onto a loaded up space to cause a scatter. Here, the red squirrels scatter into these two other red squirrels, which causes a nest to be formed. This new nest causes another scatter in that area. Then we still have to go back to the original scattering to continue resolving that in player order. This can cause even more nests. And then the current player still has their additional action to do, so they can spawn one more squirrel. Oh wow, yeah, you can start seeing how late game it's this building up of squirrel dominoes as multiple people get nest in one turn. Now for replayability, there's a decent amount with this completely modular map here. So many different combinations possible. 
Factor in how hexes have their own personality. Like this space right here, where you can spend two of any color to just put down a squirrel. Nice. Or then there's this area where you can forage in, but never spawn. And now these all coincide with all these hidden objectives you can draw to add a variety. And good news for those one player nutheads out there, this Atama mode is pretty clean. It involves the robot just continually putting down squirrels through placing on randomly flipped objectives. So you're reusing the objective deck, which is a great way to integrate one player without adding in more components. You can also see the robot's objectives, which really leads into some cool puzzling to cut them off their paths while still doing yours. While the robot doesn't deliberately plan for nests and instead just plops down squirrels every turn, in doing that, they can still make nests to cause you scattering, which adds tension. And you can get this game mode down within 20 minutes, especially on easier difficulties. The last theme is that the gameplay meets the theme pretty well. It's incredibly easy to imagine just this fox rampaging around the forest while constantly causing all these squirrels to flee. Ah, run away! But then, once you have your nest down, well, your squirrels are hunkered down, they're safe in their nest, no longer moving from that fox. Now it's time for the cons of Nut Hunt. And yep, this is a prototype copy, so I'm sure some changes are coming to the future, maybe some of the mechanics, but especially the components, because, uh, yeah, like this rule book, it's just paper right now. And I've been told there's gonna be wooden pieces, so that is cool. We just had to chug through the fox being too skinny, so it would fall over and be this orange white blob, or how there was only three player aids. Or the squirrels don't really stand up, so it doesn't matter that they're different shapes. Yeah, but come to the actual print of this, these cons will probably just be whatever. So let's get to the gameplay cons. And the first one is that this modular board ends up hurting some parts of the experience. It can get surprisingly taxing to try to map out the specific named end pass on your hidden destination cards because their location on the board doesn't follow any intuitive pattern. Remember, the board is completely modular, meaning that in every game, locations are in different places. Sure, this adds replayability, but can especially become a headache in having three or maybe four objectives and trying to continually find them in what's supposed to be a 30 minute game. For a counter example, think of Ticket to Ride, which doesn't have a modular board so that the train destination tickets or objectives to fulfill are exactly labeled on that card. Where the modular board gets especially wacky is with objective points. We understand that they try to make point scoring more dynamic by having objective hexes with higher spawn costs be worth more points. But giving more points because of costs gets a little wonky because on how often scattering occurs. You can easily just scatter into a space that will give you more points. Granted, you have to set up for scattering, so late game it's not always possible, and scattering happens more in larger player counts, so at lower player counts, spawn costs matter more. We would have much rather had at least some spaces on the board always be placed. Like perhaps the more unique tiles that give more points off of objectives be placed away from each other. This would make it less likely to luck sack an objective that gave you four points instead of three come late game, where the four points was easier to achieve than the three. And uh, hey, look, since it asked for adjacency, you actually already have it completed here. Hmm. <laughs> actually, yeah. This goes perfectly into the con of these objective cards just kind of being a toss up in general. Remember how we said you could kind of guess the objectives people are going for in the pros? This is great tension, but sometimes this guessing can just be a little too murky when these objectives are only revealed at the end of the game when you score them. There's 45 objective cards, so you can't meaningfully predict what will be drawn. And there's no way to actually know opponent's objectives at any time to give you more knowledge. Compare this again to our previous example, Take It's Ride where people only play objectives at the end, but it's way easier to tell what people are going for with the straight tracks, where once you've placed down, you're 100% certain these pieces are gonna stay. If you wanna talk about a hex-based game that also has a similarly dynamic board, we got Takunoko. While it has a lot of different types of objectives, each objective is scored during turns throughout the game and drawn from its own smaller deck that you could certainly memorize and eventually play around. As it is now with Nut Hunt, you can only play around some guesses, and then if you want to, your objective hand added onto the one objective you drew at the beginning of the game, so there's three objectives that you have knowledge of. This randomness can get brutal and how even opening the game can give players some insane leads, like these very easy objectives that overlap. Cool thing that they've included in this, one of the sheets here for our, uh, us reviewers, that they had an idea that you could choose to draw objectives, look at them, and then choose none of them. Great idea. 
We would have gone even farther to say, draw three objectives. Then you can pick zero if you want. Oh, but then how about at the game start, you draw four objectives, then you can pick two of them. That way you can get less wacky hands. Also, this deck needs to be much smaller in general. And these points lead into the next con, which is the game length. See, this hunt for all these nuts is supposed to be about 30 minutes, but especially at four to five players, it just doesn't reach that, usually taking at least 45 minutes. Obviously, this is slightly group dependent, but there's just a couple of facts about this game that just added up. One, you want to constantly survey your opponent's squirrels and nests, and how they coincide with yours, all while constantly making sure your objectives are achieved in a randomized board. Two, scattering causes players to essentially take actions on their opponent's turns, so while leading to cool moments, also just will naturally add time. Three, there's no set time limit to the game, rather it's just when the fourth S is placed by a player, but players can choose to stall the game out for one or two more rounds if they don't think they have the win yet, adding more time to the game. These three points are cool aspects that showcase this game's death. But then, maybe this amount of death isn't exactly supposed to be labeled as a 30 minute game. Nut Hunt maybe should have been labeled something like at least 30 to 45 minutes, at least. So then people can get the right idea of what to expect from this type of complexity. That's it for the cons, now it's time for the nitpicks. The first nitpick is how these nuts are managed. It's a little wonky. See, you're getting a lot of nuts in this game actually, and they're not worth any points at the end of the game. Every single turn, you move the fox, you get two nuts. If you want to spend nuts, well, you can spend two, two nuts to place. Or if you're going really big, you can spend three nuts. But then that's the only time you ever spend nuts. And if you're not spending nuts, you're usually hassling the fox, which is moving it, which means you get another nut into your inventory. This leads to big cumbersome hands, and since these cards are double-sided, many players just decide to leave them on the table, which then begs the question of why weren't these just tokens? That would feel more like nuts, right? So one reason why you might want to hoard all these nuts is to spend them for the three for one trade. Three of one nut to get one of one nut. But that's an incredibly inefficient trade, which is usually a last resort. And then there's no other way to use nuts. Remember, at most, you can only spend nuts once a turn to buy something. There's some empty space with nut management, like maybe there could have been a hand limit. Think about this notable game where you also get resources every turn with a die roll, where you actually want to be careful about having seven or more cards, since you'll have to discard half of that if a robber is activated. Sometimes you even make suboptimal trades to get below seven cards, or take an extra buy on top of buying normally to get a supplementary card with some more turn to turn nuance on nuts, then you could really be putting the nut in nut hunt, all making you care about these nuts more. The second nitpick is that of iconography. It does feel like a missed opportunity for a set location to put pieces on each hex. You can have turns where squirrels, nests, or foxes are covering up areas on a hex, further slowing down the game. Like, huh, okay. Uh, where is that uh, giant stool place I wanted? Oh. Oh, and then sometimes these nut costs are hard to see with the hex backgrounds. Ah, there we go with an outline. It is time for a tentative score on Nut Hunt. Now, with these upcoming Kickstarter games, this can be, well, a little wonky, and we can only evaluate what we've been sent for our pros and cons of this copy. So, Nut Hunt, in its current form, is going to be a 6 out of 10. It is above average. Nut Hunt just really hits home this idea of a unique engrossing movement system. The presentation is generally disarming in how cute it is, and there's few hiccups with gameplay flow with a clear rulebook and intuitive turns. There's all these fun gateway game comparisons we made in our head. There's Catan rolling to get resources, there's a ticket to ride objective routes, all while it has the Takanoke elements of a movable non-player element disrupting the board. But while Nut Hunt is this inviting and relatively short game for you to constantly disrupt your friends, squirrels, on this cool map, it doesn't feel at all like a shorter 30 minute game. Like say a 30 minute filler like King of Tokyo. In Nut Hunt, this game, you feel constantly wired to connect all your hexes. And the board is constantly shifting with all these darn squirrels and the fox moving around. Your end game score is dictated by objectives mostly that could be all negative. 
You gotta make sure that the swinginess is something that your group is okay with. And of course, there's counterplay everywhere on your opponent's hexes. But hey, remember how turns are still always tied to dice rolling for the fox. So even if you try to counterplay someone really hard, there's that light hardness that can come in to reverse scattering. It's this type of lighthearted dice rolling for moving or swingy objectives that don't have the most healthy randomness that pulls this game away from being more of a medium weight game. So then it's quite hard to categorize this game. Probably not enough meat for a medium weight, but probably too taxing for a filler. But then the constant scattering on the board still feels like a great fit for connecting objective routes. With some fine tuning with the components and rules, this could be a fine addition to a collection to interpret hex movement a little differently. Maybe you're looking for something to play when you don't quite have enough time for a medium weight game. So then this would be a, like a, uh, a, a long filler? Or you know what? This could just be a costly engaging family game where you grab nuts. Don't try hard squirrel placement so that you don't take outcomes like objective completion too seriously. My personal score for Nut Hunt is gonna be a five out of 10. I have an okay time with it, it's just fine. I think I actually just built up my expectations a little too high for this one. I saw how the movement system was really interesting, how the scoring was really dynamic, all in a fairly short time frame, and I thought, oh, you know what? I'm thinking Takunoko. Could this game be my next Takunoko? The next super accessible, cute, hex-based board game that I could play with anyone in a pinch. And so yeah, I was let down when I found out that managing named objectives on a modular board is quite a lot more annoying than I initially thought. Or how the game isn't 30 minutes. Well, that's actually a huge deal for me, and so almost always felt like the end of games strangely didn't come fast enough. In a couple games, I tried really hard to win. And while I did find there was some cool combos to be had here and there, I ultimately found that this game just wasn't complicated enough. Just doing one action on a turn didn't feel like enough. And then also, I found that there was just too much randomness with these objectives for me, for me to feel comfortable about the outcomes. Again, I can stop comparing it to Takunoko, where you do take two actions a turn and have more control over the non-player thing moving. I just wanted to spend more nuts in Nut Hunt, or build an engine to gain more nuts over time, or maybe have objectives not be so punishing if I don't achieve them. I'm the type of player who really likes to experiment with going ham for objectives, and I found out that I just couldn't do that in this game, which was disappointing. For how much thought I was putting in, I just felt like I never had a good grasp on who was gonna win the game. It felt good to put down Ness, but at the same time, it felt like you couldn't solidify your position enough. And then when someone else puts down their Ness to kick you out of your needed area late game, and then they win the game and you, lo and then you lose the game off of one hex, it feels kind of bad. I still find some promising things though, like how interaction with friends is decently high, and how this game encourages lots of unique placement with how you squirrel and nut to complete objectives. I really can't help but respect the movement system here, and I've had some decently cool moments with family because of it. That's right, I could get my family on board, and I've seen those aha moments when they figured out how to use the movement system to their advantage. It was really cool to see them start strategizing in a cute yet volatile board state. This ultimately just doesn't fill any need of mine right now. A 45 minutes to an hour game with not that much progression, not a huge amount of conflict and thoughtful yet still random objectives. Yeah, that's not really something I'm asking for. One last thing, this uh, box cover is kind of weird. That fox is smiling, but also scary at the same time. Uh, I, I don't really like looking at him. Thank you to Pine Island Games for sending this and also to our patrons for making videos possible. We got Manuel G, Brian C, Clifford H, Aaron W, Max B, Bora, Jeremy M, C, Charlie Pico, Tedes, Semester, Officer, I'm Y, Vosky, Brian G, your fellow, Matt G, Spears, Ron, Ron J, Brad G, Tom Alpier, Mark A, Jasmine, Evan B, Charles B, Junior, Josh J, Basbar, Brado, Radu, Sophie, Ron Z, Colin Lesson, Hudson D, Pierce B, Omar F, MY, Ethan P, Bradley J, Josh C, Calum Fee, Art Turkess, SS Co, Alex L, Rob Bar, Sensor 2, Dave F, Josh R, Pat, Cyril C, Il Wayne, Colum, Mir H, Rylas Spin, Kion S, Alba Books, Colin C, John P, Nicholas R, Robin, Andre, Kevin G, Alex G, Tim W, Jordan F, Ben A, Jeff B, Alvin Y, Michael Z, and Jeremy G. This video is also being released a little later than we're filming it, so some patrons might not get covered in this. Sorry guys. We also got our Mad Lads of Cardboard. We got ZL, Jeff L, Peter Z, and that guy right there. We got our Mad Lady of Cardboard. We got Amy. So yeah, that was Nut Hunt. Nut Hunt. Remember to like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.